in nature said this is the biggest environmental success story of the 2000s. My guest today is Gilberto Camara, who worked at the Brazil Institute for Space Research, or INPI, for over 35 years, being its director general from 2005 to 2012, where he was instrumental in using satellite images to map deforestation in Brazil. But mapping alone isn't enough, and while Brazil is home to one of the biggest forests in the world, the country also has a tough, complex history. Brazil was through a military dictatorship. The trees weren't worth anything. This is a long conversation. We go deep into not just the mapping, but also the policies and actions that are required to lead to actual change. The government decided to do something unthinkable in the United States, and I would argue unthinkable in Europe. Gilberto is clearly someone who has a strong will to create change for the environment, beyond ideals and into the necessary steps required to make those changes a reality, facing the pushbacks and incentives of, well, the real world. I hope you found value in this conversation with Gilberto Camara. This episode is sponsored by OpenCage. If you're building any application or tool that uses location data, at some point, you'll probably need to convert place names or addresses into coordinates or coordinates back into place names. And this is where OpenCage comes in. They offer a worldwide, affordable, forward and reverse geocoding service that's easy to use. OpenCage builds on top of open data sources, which grants much more lenient licensing terms than alternatives like Google, allowing you to store the data as you want and even keep it after you stop being a customer. You can also display it on any map, all at a more affordable price. OpenCage handles all the complexity of dealing with the messiness of the real world and provides a simple to use API that allows you to focus on your use case. They have a generous free trial that you can use to get started with no credit card required, and they offer a clear upfront pricing with a cancel at any time, no questions asked policy. To learn more, head over to opencagedata.com. I'll have a link in the show notes. As a side note, OpenCage is also responsible for hosting the Geomob events, as well as the Geomob podcast, for which I'll also have links in the show notes. Thank you to OpenCage for once again being a sponsor and for their continuous support of the podcast. I don't know if you know, I, I like starting these conversations the same way every single time. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. So quite curious, how would you describe yourself? Well, I would describe myself in general terms in my professional life as a geospatial engineer. Uh, of course, I am been in the geospatial field for in 1978. That makes 46 years. Is that correct? That's probably right. And uh, in this uh, period, of course, I have invested a lot in a career that combines uh, what we, it's called geographic information science and uh, spatial science. Uh, but of course, with a sense of engineering, with a sense of getting things done. But that is also combined with a sense of um, why things are done. And therefore, I've been quite involved in public policy making in terms of using geographical data. But all this comes up, if I have to think a single term, I would use just geospatial engineer because I think that sums up better what I have done, which is an engineer have to understand the science, but has to put together the pieces so things work. That's, I, that's what I, I would prefer to call myself. Can you take me back? So one of the big impacts and, and big works that you've done is related to deforestation in the Amazon. I'd like to go back to 1980. Can you tell me what's the situation at that time? What are we... What are people talking about, and what is some of the work that you start doing? If you'd let, if you'd go back in time and then walk me through, you know, at a high level, what was the situation and the need for some of your work? So, if you go back to the seventies and the eighties, first of all, there was no, uh, there was before the famous Brundtland Report, our common future, and in the seventies we were 
in Brazil was through a military dictatorship who was authoritarian and and who had a vision that the environment or Amazon was an area that need to be occupied. The so trees weren't worth anything. You need to put cattle there to make it them the area worth something. Of course, this was also linked to the fact that most of the the, for, the forests in Brazil lie far away from the main cities, very far away in terms of uh, geographical location. So the Amazon was at that time was a very small population, five million, perhaps less, and it was necessary in the vision of the military to start occupying their lands at whatever cost to the indigenous population, to the environment, whatever, there was not a concern, in order to occupy the land to avoid that land being grabbed by someone else. So it was very military thinking. Now, so what happens in the 70s, we were, in Brazil was through a military dictatorship who was authoritarian and is that the 70s and the 80s were decades of destruction in the Amazon and decades of unchecked destruction. If you ever come about, there is a documentary the BBC did called The Decade of Destruction, which is fantastic. So it started outside of Brazil. The fact that uh, outsiders, very good documentaries, realized and then some of policymakers started to realize that there was something wrong going on, that one of the repositories of biodiversity, and now we know, of course, a key repository of carbon, was destroyed at an astonished rate without any checking. So uh, the Brazil, Brazilian Institute of Space Research, INPE, where I did my career, uh, started in the 70s, basically training people, getting young people uh, degrees. Sometimes they would go to the United States or somewhere else to do their PhDs, and getting a science team to understand the use of remote sensing, and started to use remote sensing. But the political climate was not, during the military dictatorship, favorable to bad news. So it was a time to build capacity. So I was actually hired by INPE fresh out of school in 1980. Let me interrupt you there. Can you describe what INPE is, by the way? INPE is the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research. INPE is, was created in the 60s uh, modeling part of NASA. Not all of NASA, but part of NASA, which had the missions which were at that time original missions in NASA, which were considered to be relevant for Brazil. And was actually created by a military, a, an Air Force colonel. But the, was it identified that, for example, the area of remote sensing, where NASA was an early uh, stronghold, uh, the area of uh, space meteorology, meteorology from satellites, and the area of space geophysics were three scientific areas where it all started. And then EP started developing capacity in these three areas. So remote sensing, um, meteorology from space, uh, satellite meteorology, and then space geophysics. And later on, but that's in the EP also started to develop the capacity to build uh, satellites. So it is, in a certain sense, an institution that has the capacity to build Earth observation satellites, the capacity to do research in remote sensing, space geophysics, and more lately, meteorology, and, and including uh, Earth system change, but that came later. So the start of EMP is to see what NASA was doing to bring these technologies out of the United States, fresh out of the box, to Brazil, and to use them to the benefit of the Brazilian population. As it went on, EP maintained its duality, which is both a research institution who grants masters and PhDs, and a service, an institution that provides service, like much like, for example, 
let's say the analogous would be uh, this uh, labs that the United States have. Of course, they're not the same areas, but if you think about the Goddard Space Flight Center, which is a NASA lab, very strong, very strong on Earth observation. They have other labs like Jet Propulsion Lab, which is the one that builds the Mars and Jupiter and Pluto. But this was more akin to Goddard Space Flight Center, which was the more environmental area of those. So that's where we started. So we started, I think, in the right point was building, empowering people. So people had the chance to learn about the new technologies. They, they were learning as the technology was developed. You have to remember the Landsat is 1972. So what happened is that in 1974, Brazil was receiving Landsat images. It was the third country in the world who actually was uh, had a ground station. So we first, the obvious place, the United States, second, Canada, third, Brazil. Uh, at that time, Landsat is one of the first public, it, well, actually, I don't know. Is it one of the first public programs to the first. I mean, at the time, what did you have? You have nothing in Europe, okay, nothing Russian, not even China. China was not China. And, and then what you had was a NASA program for Earth observation, Landsat 1, which is designed in NASA and built and operated uh, in terms of Earth observation. And they didn't have uh, on bo onboard data recorders. So the only way to get data from Landsat was to get a ground station. So when the satellite passed, you would receive the signals, and then you store, and then you had the agreement that that data would also be relayed back to the United States, which is now the Aeros Data Center. So they would have a copy. So, so we, in that sense. The remote sensing activities in EMP started together with the Landsat program. So you joined in 1980. I joined 1980, fresh off of engineering school. I'm an electronics engineer by by a bachelor's. So I have a bachelor in electronics engineer in a, in a good school in Brazil, in a school which is very competitive. It was created, and it's another story about that we should that was the creation of the military. Uh, the military in Brazil created the school, and then they wanted to build planes. Brazil at that time did not even make bicycles. So they created the school. <laughs> yes, that's the 1950s. And they, because these military had gone to war, and they found out that Brazil was completely, completely like years, decades behind the technology, the basic technology that was employed in the Second World War. So what they did was say, we're going to build planes. And what is the best place in the world to teach students to build planes? The MIT. So they get these professors from the aeronautics department in MIT. These guys come to Brazil. They were well paid. And they set up a, a, set up a school in the spirit of MIT. Extremely tough to enter, extremely tough to finish. You know, tough, tough, tough all along. Still exists, still very tough to enter, very selective. So to get out of it, to get in, you had to be good. To get out, you had to be very good. And and that's, that's, that. So there was not the point here when I'm telling the story is that there is this sense in many places that you have to make compromises uh, for developing natures. In other words, if a technology is going to be introduced in developing nations, the people, you have to assume that the people in this um, less capable, less well-trained, and uh, they would not be at a par to what you would have in the North. I mean, the obvious contra argument is now China. Now, looking at China these days, how did they, did they, could they do whatever they are doing without extremely hard and good engineering? 
So my point has always been that the fact that you were born in a developing country should not put you necessarily in an eternal disadvantage. As long as you understand that there are no compromises in quality, there can be, if you do something, you have to do it right. And you have to do with world-class quality as much as you can and not say this is good enough for Brazil, but maybe not good enough for the United States. So back to INPI. So the standards of quality of getting, for example, a master's degree or getting a PhD or even producing science have always been something that MP as an organization has pushed through. It's more success or less success, but there was never a doubt that you could aim to be uh, an, an institution just because you were in developing countries that you could get away with being second rate. So this was clear. Now, you would never be in an institution in Brazil be first rate in technology for the Arctic or the Antarctic. But in forest, tropical forest, you should be able to get people at their own game and to do research and do technologies, which would be at least as good as the one coming from the North. There's no inherent reason why that should not be the case. So this is a long winded story to go back to our timeline. So we're back in the eighties where the Amazon is being destroyed. A few voices are starting to be heard internationally. Not, there's no Prince Charles at that time, but they were starting to have voices saying, well, this is bad, this is serious. And uh, then things started to happen when the World Bank issued a report on around the late 80s, stating that deforestation in Brazil was 80,000 square kilometers per year just in the Amazon. Uh, if you take it uh, 80,000, that's about two, almost three times uh, Switzerland, just to get a, a sense of Switzerland is somewhere 30, yeah, not about this. So two, three times the size of Switzerland every year. Every year. At the same right. time, Brazil went through a democratic transition in 1985. And the new government and the Brazilian diplomats started to get a sense that you could not just do business as usual, especially in the viral, environmental area. So then the diplomats agreed that Brazil would be the host of a major event on, on climate change, which is the Rio summit. And, and a real summit is, is, is like a milestone in the whole of the environmental debate. There's, first of all, because it was in Rio that the three big conventions of environment were created. The Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biodiversity, and the Convention on Desertification. It was in Rio that you started discussing the need for global agreement, which led to Kyoto and then later on to Paris. So. And, of course, Brazil being Brazil, you have to understand that we're not China, we're not India, we're close to Russia in a certain sense, because there is no such thing as a Brazilian. I mean, if you, the only Brazilians that can call themselves Brazilian are, of course, the indigenous populations that live, you know, in the reservations. But we all Myself, my family, of course, my, uh, they all, my family came from the Madeira Island. So we all from somewhere. For over, our culture is European. Portuguese is an European language. It's not China. In that sense, uh, we were very, very sensitive to what the opinions abroad are. So 
Grand Brazil decided to host the Rio 92 summit, Brazil had to show to the world that it was doing something for the environment. And therefore, Brazil started to do systematic surveying of deforestation in the Amazon. And the EP was tasked of doing the survey. So that starts late 80s, so it starts in 86, 87, and in 88 we produced the first uh, point of the time series, which is how much has been deforested from 88 to 89. And that, let's say, that information has been produced every year since, always with improved technique, but always with the sense that you need this information to be a public, but, and to help do something. But it was in the beginning, we proved Zeus proved conclusively that the numbers of deforestation every year was not as high as the World Bank did. It was more like 20,000 kilometers per year. But 20,000 is enormous there, still enormous. And then there's the debate, how do you curb this deforestation, such big deforestation? And then the debate internally in Brazil was between the starting, the, it was starting to gain ground after Rio 92, the environment movement, and the forces which always have and always will have uh, the use and the property of the land and the use of the land as they see fit. In that sense, we uh, Brazil, when it started in, as a country, as a Portu possession of Portugal, they divided the Brazilian land and gave to some lords in the Portuguese court. And of course, it goes on and on. So a lot of the lands in Brazil were actually private property. And those agricultural producers had obviously a, a sense of legitimacy and of course of property and did, didn't want to hear about environmental protection. This is one of the big topics that I'd like to understand for when we hear about deforestation, I think sometimes it feels like there is a uh, soulless thing that just removes trees because it's evil and that we must at all costs stop this force from removing trees. And we can map tr deforestation, but understanding why it's there in the first place, I feel like is probably more complicated than being able to map it as well. And one of the interesting things that I'm hearing from what you're saying is that one of the problems is that most of it is private land that went from... With trees, it's worth nothing to, if I put cattle on it, now this land that is mine becomes worth something. So there's this financial incentive right. to make the land worth something That's away right. from being forested. Exactly. And this financial incentive and this, let's put it this way, we use a <laughs> typical word, entrepreneurship, was actually potentialized in the 80s and the 90s. So we're back to a point where Brazil had the information, so we're talking about 1988, um, and there was a huge pressure for Brazil, but the Brazilian government was dragging their feet. In the late 90, in late 80s, we're starting to be able to map, but nothing happens. Nothing happens. Is that? That's correct. Why not? Because the forces, you can think of it, let's take out the way, the forces that promote deforestation. These are, first of all, they don't come from mm -hmm. Amazonia. They don't come from the areas which are deforested. These are agriculture, which are in fact descendant from the European immigrants who settled down in the south of Brazil. The south of Brazil, which is below 
the Capricorn Tropic, which is like a subtropical zone, almost a temperate zone, has a huge tradition of immigration associated with agricultural production. In many cases, uh, they, because of the not so much abundant land, they had a small, small properties, which still exist to these days. And then the huge area between, let's say, think of, of Paradel 40 up to Paradel 12. Okay, so you have a huge area up there, which was not very much inhabited, and there were no, let's say, technologies that could generate strong agricultural produce and strong yield in the Brazilian savannas. So this region that goes up to the beginning of the forest. The Brazilian Agriculture Research Organization developed technologies that were able to exploit the climate of the savanna to produce soy and later to produce corn. And then also new technologies for, for uh, herbaceous uh, pasture, which um, actually improved the uh, productivity of cattle raising. And then these guys who were entrepreneurs, they came from the south, and they went up north. They are a huge migration of cities. They grabbed all the land which was available, the, the land which was used to be public, that was given to them by the government. And then they started rolling up whatever was in front, trees, savannas, anything, and they started producing soy, they started producing corn, which goes to this day. Economically, uh, this made a huge difference because Brazil is now the world's second soybean exporter after the United States. So this means money. Now, on the other hand, who's against it? So the, you know who's in favor. These guys exist. They have names, surnames, uh, social security numbers. They have owned farms. They have production. Okay. On the other hand, who's on the other side? The other side, you have the environmental movement and of course, local, internationally, and pressure, which varies from time to time, from foreign governments, who now more than before, are concerned about environmental degradation. And this is a shifting boundary. So at moments, this boundary shifts depending on, for example, who's the president. So when EP actual signal that was worked on in 1995, about for 1995 reported in 1996. So deforestation in 1995 reached 30,000 square, 20,000 square kilometers, the, the highest, highest reported uh, value to date. Sorry, is that 20 or 30? 29. When it's bad enough. 29. Okay, 29. 29. It's, bad, it's bad So enough. that's a 50% increase compared to... To what? 88. Compared to 88. Exactly. So we have uh, technological innovation. That means that now these lands that are part of the Amazon forest become more economically interesting because right. it's easier to farm them out. So you, that leads to an increase in deforestation, so as we just said, 50% in something like six years. Right. These people are bringing in a lot of value. Like they're bringing in a lot of money. Right. Uh, it's probably taxes that they're paying as well. So there's, right. like, that's what I'm thinking in the back of my head. Like That's correct. That's... From, from a governmental point of view, you now have a lot more money as well. So it looks like it's getting better for, I, I can imagine people are like, this is great. Well, you see, that's, you have to understand that the Rio 92 conference had a huge impact in Brazil. Okay. Okay. So the impact that we were a country which, whose international projection would never come from any military prowess. In fact, Latin America is the only continent 
that I know, that is free of nuclear weapons. There's a treaty signed. Mexico down. No country, all countries have committed never to develop nuclear weapons. And that's a unique situation in the world. And, and there's not been any major wars between these countries for at least a century. Now, you cannot assume that a country like Brazil, who has ambitions, will ever get any kind of power by the military might that it might want. And therefore, and it would never be, and now it's more clear than ever, that it's about purely economic power. That's not also the case. So the only... It's, it's not, sorry? By economic power. At, I mean, okay. if you look at long-term thinking, you have reasons why the industry is in China and now in India. <laughs> the obvious reason is you have much more people to work and much more qualified people to fill posts in industry that need qualification. And it's no accident that China has developed a mighty industrial power. And Brazil has no way to compete with China. At that. So what's left? One of the things that's left is the environmental power. So after reunited two, let's say the think thinking in the thinking places that was involved, the diplomats, for example, and uh, led to the thinking that if Brazil was going to project any power worldwide, it had to be with environment. This was crystal clear for the diplomats. I've talked to many diplomats, has been crystal clear, and of course was crystal clear to many analysts of the Brazilian society. At that moment, 95, when deforestation turned to be 30,000 square kilometers, the government decided to do something unthinkable in the United States, and I would argue unthinkable in Europe, was to increase unilaterally, without negotiating to anyone, the area inside private lands that needed to be preserved in the Amazon. So Brazil is unique. You don't have that in Europe. You may have agreements, but the area, the area inside the private farm in the Amazon, by law, needs to have 70% of its area still covered by natural force. It was used before 95 was 35. The government then imposed a 70%. One-sidedly. It went bad with the agriculture sector. It, of course, went good with the diplomats. And this fight is going on. It's not, it's not, I'm not saying that every farm in the Amazon is preserving 70%. I'm saying that there is a law that says it should be. And because without a law, you cannot enforce compliance. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Okay. Again, and how, then the, the next question comes, how do you know how, who has 70% of its area? You need reliable right. information, which only comes from the satellites and goes back to the early point. So at that moment, the government recognized the need to act, but it was still fearful of the uh, extent by which the exposure of uh, let's say, the deforestation information would cause harm to Brazilian policies. So in 1995, we were under a government of the center-left or center-centrist government led by Fernando Cardoso, who was a very learned man, but he was trying to balance between these forces. And then it went more or less like this until 2000. And two, 2003. And then 2002, we have a big change, which is the election of uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, or Lula as it is known. Lula is, again, there's no parallels. I don't think there's ever been uh, an, uh, 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 a metal worker who used to be in the union of metal workers, 
becoming president of a major country. I'm yet to see, I'm trying to remember the stories of Germany and France, and I don't think there's anything like this anywhere. And um, so Lula comes into power with a center-left coalition, but of course with the presence of the left. And part of his coalition was the environmental movement. So Lula had uh, playing, he had, of course, a stronger part, a strong part of his coalition were the unions, but the farmers, the, the soy workers, the cattle ranchers were not part of his coalition, never were, and never will be. His coalition is urban and poor. It's, it's part urban, poor, and educated. There is a part of it which is the environmentalists, which are the educated guys who are for Lula, and the poor, for obvious reasons, they need uh, a union leader. And then Lula appointed as Minister for the Environment, Marina Silva, which is, she's back to Brazil, she's new the Minister for the Environment 20 years later. Uh, and Marina comes from the jungle. Marina comes from, she learned, to, she learned to, to read and write at the age of 19. She comes from the deep jungle, from Acre, very, very, you know, very poor, poor family. She had to be educated by nuns because there was no school. And so she understands Amazon because she's from there. So she has a kind of legitimacy that it's not easy to find somewhere else. And, and Marina comes, of course, with big support from the environment movement. But she didn't have the, the tools to act. And then at that point, I was director for... Earth Observation, so MP had a general director, then a director for Earth Observation, and I was very close to Marina and the environment movement. And then in 2002, 2000, yeah, 2002, we got the election 2003. So new government, so the government is elected in 2002, starts working in 2003. And uh, we were talking behind the scenes, with Marina's people, saying, well, we need to change the narrative of the deforestation. And the narrative has to be changed to empower public policies to fight deforestation. And the only way to do that is to fully make all of the data, what I mean, each and every polygon which has been detected as deforested, available. So anyone who is actually the owner of the land where the, their deforestation polygon has been detected can be held compliant because he's breaking the law. So you want to make the information that's used to enforce the law visible by everybody. Everybody. So there's no... So it's... You can't be... Someone can't come to you and say, like, well, where does this come from? Right. Like, it's basically to make it more accountable. Exactly. The, the, making that data open is a way to make the enforcement of the law more accountable. Absolutely. So we knew that, and that was something we knew early on from, let's say, the, the, the early late 90s in our discussions, is that it was not sufficient to have th just that data available internally in the government. What's, what's the response to that? So we're back to 2003, okay, 20 years ago. We understood that the only way the information about deforestation would be effective for public policy is that if it would be completely and openly available without restrictions to anyone. Mm -hmm. And we knew there was a huge part of the Brazilian government which were opposed to that. Of course, the agricultural sector was opposed to that. The military were opposed to that. And the diplomats were opposed to that. Uh, because, of course, the diplomats were worried about Brazil's place in the world. So I talked to Marina. We, we, Marina said to me, okay, let's find a way to do it. And I, then we had an opportunity. There was a meeting in early 2003 where, that's very typical of Brazil, that the, every year there's a, we call it a requiem, a requiem, high-level requiem. 
when the director of EPO or the director of Earth Observation goes to the government in Brasilia, and typically there is a minute, there is a meeting by eight or ten ministers to uh, where the data from reforestation is presented. So I, I remember very well to this day. And then in the eve of the meeting, I told Marina, Marina, the only way that we get this data open is that if we do it and don't ask anyone for their opinions. And if we get away with it, this is going to work. If we actually send a letter to anyone asking if we can do it, the answer will be no. And she said, yes. So I asked, the only thing I'm asking you, if I like chocolate and when I'm in prison, you please bring chocolate to me. She said, okay. So next day comes, and there was the, uh, what we call here the Minister of the Environment. It was there, Science and Technology, Foreign Relations, Agriculture, Infrastructure, Transportation, Chief of Staff, who else? But, uh, agrarian Reform. There were 10 ministers in the table, and I present the data from deforestation, and I say, and tomorrow, thanks to the new open policy of the Lula government, this data is going to be in the internet. And that was it. And Marina blinks the eye to me, and I blink the eye to Marina, and that's how the data for deforestation in the Amazon is on the web to this day. No, no one, no one has ever signed any paper. So it took guts. Simply, it's there. We decided to do it and did it. And after it's there, of course, as time changed, the Supreme Court now has a decision by the Supreme Court saying that it's obligation of the Brazilian government to do so. At that time, there was no decision of the Supreme Court. Now I'm, I'm, I'm in the clear. I cannot be prosecuted. <laughs> so after that, things start to move. In 2005, Marina asked us to do something she needed, which was the first real-time deforestation alert system. Now there are many uh, global forests. Where at that time, there was nothing. And all we had to work with was MODIS. There was no Sentinel. There was, there was MODIS. Can you uh, remind me what's the what's the resolution spatially and temporally of MODIS to, to give MODIS an idea? has a nice temporal resolution, which it actually there are at least daily images or twice uh, every two days. There's images of the Brazilian Amazon, and uh, but the problem is it has a 250 by 250 meter resolution, very coarse. So we had to train a lot of good interpreters, visual interpreters, because no automatic data would do that, to detect deforestation, new areas of deforestation using MODIS. And then the data was relayed in real time on the web, of course sent to the government, but also put on the web. Now, of course, we're doing deforestation alerts with much better satellites and so on, but that's another story. But at that time, it was the information which was available for law enforcement in real time. And this made a difference. So this forestation then goes down enormously from, the, from 27,000 square kilometers in 2004 to 4.5 thousand kilometers in 2012. It was considered, and still is, Nature wrote, and Nature said, this is the biggest environmental success story uh, of the, the, let's say, the 2000s. It was a huge environmental success story. So the story was, there was a clear need for accurate and qualified satellite information for the government. The more, I mean, Accuracy was secondary to timelessness. You need to have it fast. You need to be open. And so this is like, to fit, close the one side story. So this was a major success story in terms of remote sensing being used. Uh, so you need to have both a careful accounting, yearly accounting of every area, and you need to have 
a second bit, which is the fast system, the alert system, which will not never be accurate as the one of, that we use Sentinel, for example, 10 meter or whatever, but it needs to be fast. It needs to be time information. And then we had, so this was 2012, and then we entered a period, a very turbulent period in Brazil, which led to the election of Brazilian Trump, Mr. Bolsonaro. From 2016 to 2018 to 2022, we had four years of misgovernment, anti-environment, uh, winner takes all and complete discontrol and complete lack of control. So now, since 2023, we have Marina back, we have Lula back, and we have an understanding of the need and the value of qualified uh, remote sensing information with, of course, a huge effort in law enforcement. So these two things have come to a point where there are no longer questions. They are premises of, let's say, a deforestation control. There's no more discussion whether the data needs to be produced, data should be fast, data should be... This is long past. Now the question becomes, how bad are you, how much you can improve your data, what can you do the new satellites, or can you use the Sentinel-1? So it becomes no longer a debate of remote sensing is useful or not. It becomes a debate, give me better data. There's so many places I want to take this. The, the first two things that come to mind is, so you put the data out, why does that, like, how do you go from that to the, the deforestation going down? Let's start with that. Okay. Just because there's a map out there, how, how do you go? You, you said there was a big piece of enforcement. Right. I'm quite curious about that because I think sometimes we uh, imagine that if only people knew, the problem would solve itself. But that's not necessarily how it works. You need someone that goes, especially if it's remote places in the Amazon, just because you can see it doesn't mean something's going to happen. So I'm quite curious what led to that turning into that that open data turning into an actual decrease in the deforestation amounts if you go back a little in time you have to understand the foundations of the modern states which were laid in the 18th century in france germany and so on they mean uh, the establishment of what we now call you know democracy, but you need to have pillars. And one of these pillars is the monopoly of violence, which is given to the, to the state. And this is so common that you now think the police should solve that, that you don't realize how long it took in France or Germany or the UK for this to be set up. So the establishment of modern democracies, of civilized society, goes hand in hand with the capacity of the state to assert the law. There is never, and there has never been a case anywhere in the world where people will, will act nicely, uh, just spontaneously. People have, what you can have is legitimacy or not of power. If your power is applied in a legitimate way, uh, for example, if you fight crime in the streets of France, for example, uh, whether that, that power is applied in a legitimate way or not. And therefore, in the case of deforestation, it's never been a situation where people would start doing it. There is, first of all, like I said, there is a legal framework which establishes a limit to how much deforestation you can have inside your property, which has been systematically, it's a fight to recover that. The other part of the legal framework is that any cut, any cut in forest, in the Amazon or in the savannah, Serrano, has to be authorized by an, an entity of typically the, the state god, the local god. 
So when you see in the alert system a cluster of new deforested areas, it turns out to be efficient from the point of view of mobilization to get some helicopters there with the federal police and the environmental agencies, go there and say, where's your authorization? If you don't, I'm going to burn your machines. And you actually burn the machines. Burn. You don't confiscate. It used to be the time when people would confiscate the big bulldozers. No, no, no longer. Because they would go back to the judge and so da 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 and they get the machines back. Nowadays, the law says the government has the right to burn, burn, burn. They pick up a enormous truck, which is deforesting, and they just burn it. And Unless you have a permit. Because the problem here is that so much Amazon has been deforested already. That it's very hard to get a legal valid permit. So since maybe now by our accounts, 91 or 90% of deforestation is illegal. So whoever you get is illegal. And again, it's, it's a crime. It's, just, it's a crime from the point of view of the law and should be treated as any crime, like a burglary in a city, or someone assaults a bank, or whatever, or whatever, robbery, it's a crime. The guy has to be punished. So, it's it, by treating this not as something light, but by treating it under the same mechanisms that establish democratic societies. It is the only way Humanity knows how to get out of the jungle. So the legitimacy of the whole process is that the information, obviously, obviously, you need qualified information. You should never go there with your helicopters, with your federal police, if the information turns out to be wrong. You don't want to go there. No, yeah, in the middle yeah. of nowhere. Burn someone's pick up a helicopter, planes, the and then pick up the bulldozer and say, no, no, this is legal. Or, no, no, nothing's happening here. So the information producers have to be absolutely aware that they are in very similar positions as the doctors that, uh, for example, uh, diagnose you with a disease. They have to be very careful. You cannot just say you have cancer. You have to be very careful. No, it's a t- no, no, but I, that's a great analogy. That's why I laugh. Because it's, I think it, treating it as something as serious as that, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, have, you, you need to be careful about your diagnosis. You need to be experienced. And you need to do that on a regular, absolutely regular basis. So the whole deforestation story, it is a situation that it was not this when we started in the 80s. But it turned out to be that the pieces had to be put together. Publicity, openness, quality, compliance, legal support, legal support in the courts, and all that. So So it becomes as it is In France, you cannot go, I mean, it's only Mr. Trump that can say he can shoot someone in the middle of the streets and get away with it. But in France, you don't do this, right? And in England, you don't do this. You know, if you shoot someone in the middle of the the street, you get in jail. The same as that. And the same reason, if you deforest an area where you shouldn't be doing, you should be in jail. You should be fined, your equipment should be destroyed. And so the whole deforestation is a case and that's a very important bit there, that the responsibility of those that produce the information is, uh, I repeat, akin to medical doctor that has to diagnose. And this leads to something which is quite interesting from the remote sensing point of view. There have been uh, a number of efforts made by many actors to streamline 
the production of information using remote sensing for tropical forests, namely Global Forest Watch, namely Google, Think that Go and Google Earth Engine. Maybe you may have heard of Map Biomas and so on. Now, all they say, all very nice, all very good. What is your level of accuracy? And the problem here, you don't get away with making operational, uh, let's say, systems that combat deforestation if your level of accuracy is 20, 80%. Why? If you miss 20%, miss, and I, I'm going to just distinguish here between false positives and false negatives. False positive is a situation when you say, lady so-and-so, you have breast cancer, and she doesn't have breast cancer. False negative is a situation where she doesn't, you say she doesn't have breast cancer, but she has breast cancer. From the doctor's point of view, you want to avoid as much as possible false negatives. Because if you say, well, I have diagnosed uh, breast cancer, but please do a second or a third study. Just to check, do a, another check, use some other checking, check something else. You decrease the chance of the worst thing, which is saying she doesn't have it and she develops. In deforestation is the contrary. We need to avoid false positives like the plague. What is a false positive? False positive is a situation where you say, Mr. So-and-so has a farm in Mato Grosso and he has deforested 50 square kilometers of his farm. And he hasn't. False negative is a situation where Mr. So-and-so has deforested 50 kilometers of this farm, but you don't detect it. And the essence here is the two are not equivalent. Because the agricultural sector, in every country in the world, you just see what they're doing in France, what they're doing in the Netherlands, blocking streets. And I mean, these guys are not going away anytime soon. The Gilets Jaunes and so on and so on. So, since the agricultural sector is extremely powerful in terms of money and in terms of parliament, because they have votes, if you uh, issue even a little bit, but if you any false positive that is signaled in your system can be used against you, not necessarily in court. You make a martyr out of someone. Yes, and can be a great give them the weapons too. Right? Yeah, and in fact, I could spend another two hours telling you how many times the agricultural sector tried to discredit our team in EP and take away our data. How many times we've been accused of being uh, paid under the carpet of paying by whoever the environmental NGOs or you know, this kind of accusations that you levy on people because you just don't like them, so they're under the under the, the book of someone else. Obviously, that at the cost of having false negatives, you are very careful, one is very careful, to avoid false positives. So normally what comes out of Brazil deforestation system is a very reliable in terms of false positive. And this kind of reliability is not easy to achieve into systems, automated systems that are based on Google Earth Engine and similar, like uh, Global Forest Watch and others. You need a much more sophisticated approach, which is still, I think, coming of force. I think we're coming of age now. Uh, to replace uh, the system which we have currently because the trust-based, let's say, base upon which the whole enforcement 
stands is reliability of your information. So I see a lot, you know, I'm a reviewer of, you probably are in the area, of course, and uh, if you go to International Journal of Remote Sensing, Remote Sensing Journal, and uh, Remote Sensing of Environment, you get a lot of papers saying, oh, I've achieved 85%. That's fantastic in one area. I look at those papers and I say, well, fine. So what? You know, I have to achieve 93% in the whole Amazon, which is bigger than Europe. And when you achieve that, you come talk to me. So I think... This probably took an hour and a half or one hour and 15 minutes, but it's probably a part which you, I think probably should wrap up now because you have a good sense of, 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 of all the issues which are involved, which are not obvious. Let me tell you one last one because I've been trying to tell this to people and, and, and it's incredible because, okay, it concerns the very, one of the most misunderstood topics in Earth's observation, and particularly in remote sensing, which is the accuracy itself. And, and how do you get first, how do you get the accuracy, and how do you set it? Now, if you look across the, the landscape in terms of systems which uh, are used to detect deforestation. Tropical forests, Brazil, Amazonia, Congo, Indonesia, Vietnam, no matter what, and even in other areas. Their approach is typically the following. They go to Google Earth Engine and they say, well, I'm going to study the Congo Basin. I'm going to get uh, the median images for say, year X, 2022. And I'm going to do a classification out of that. I'm going to map. Okay. And then you say, okay, and that's 2022. And what about 2023? And the same guy, or the same team, goes to Google Earth Engine again, picks up the 2023 image, does the calculation, and then compares the maps. It's 20 years that I've been telling people in somewhere that this is completely wrong. This is nonsense. This is wrong, wrong, wrong. And no one understands what I'm doing. Maybe if I do the podcast, someone will listen. Okay. The very basic fact of statistics is the following. The question being the following. Are your observations independent or not? It's well-known statistics that if your observations are independent, okay, uh, if you go to, you know, to go to see, I don't know if you're a fan of football, but let's suppose you go in Champions League and there are two semifinals, Barcelona versus Bayern and uh, Manchester City versus Paris Saint-Germain. Let's put it this way. Okay? And then, Let's say you're, you're you're getting trying to guess and get some money out of 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 of, of putting your hopes on Paris Saint Germain against Manchester City and the Barcelona against Bayern. And if you put this way, of course, the fact that Barcelona plays against Bayern and Manchester City goes against PSG, they are independent events. Okay, so the chance that you get one right is one thing. The chance that you get both right is, of course, subject to the error that you might commit in one and the other. Okay. Now back to the Congo Basin. If you issue um, an observation for 2022, you then independently issue an observation for 2023 and you change. You have two independent observations of deforestation Congo Basin two different times. And what hap What is the statistics say? The errors are added, actually the square root of the variance of both, which means that you increase the error, the resulting statistic of change has more error than the original one, 2022, or the original one in 2023. 
right? Of course, you are. And then, of course, the next year, you're going to increase your error up to the limit. So how do you do it? You don't do it. You start with a mask of areas which already have been deforested in 2022. And for 2023, you'll only look at the new positives in the forest area. So instead of comparing two de independent developments, 2022 and 2023, you take 2022 as input to 2023, you only look at the forest areas in 2023, and therefore you don't sum the errors. There is, of course, there's a temporal dependence on that, which increases the quality and reduces the error. And Prodis has been doing this since 1998. And people still are producing data in SIPO, in FAO, in Congo, the old way of comparing to. And there's nothing we can do. I mean, I, I, I've been getting tired. I don't know if I'm going to see progress before I die, because I get tired of telling people this is wrong. And they, my problem is, I think, that they don't know enough statistics to understand why it is wrong. And back to the problem of remote sensing, which I think many of the work and many of the people that work in remote sensing fail seriously to understand the issues of accuracy assessment in remote sensing data. And, and the fact that so many, uh, let's say, papers and, and theses and works and methods get developed and published, which do not learn a lesson, which is as simple as that. Reduce the error as much as possible. Don't take observations subsequent years as independent events. Time is important. This is a critical lesson, perhaps the most critical lesson and under-understood lesson of the whole Brazilian deforestation system, is how are we able to keep getting high accuracy year after year? And it's not a miracle. It's getting the statistics right. So I think we could close now. This, uh, this is just my <laughs> story because I got sad because I go to conferences, I say this, and people say, oh, what? Someday they're going to listen. Do you think that might come because by how the tools are today? So it is easier to create a map for 2022 and a map for 2023 in the tools that we have today than it is to make one, use that as a mask, like the approach that you were talking about, uh, more than it is like unawareness or I, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud. Like wh what do you think are some of the courses? Because the, the way of processing imagery has become so different over the past decades. It's kind of the, the barrier to entry has been so much lower. What is the, conceptually, what is deforestation? A forest is a forest, okay? A forest. Uh, a park is a park. A park to Fontainebleau. Or, but what is deforestation? And then you start to say, wow, deforestation is something that starts and supposedly starts with a forest that's there and ends with a lot of trees on the ground and a clear the ground, and then when the cows come in. Okay. The starts and ends. So conceptually, this is different. It happens in time. You have a start, has an end. So this is called spatial ontology. When you start understanding what kinds of things that exist on Earth can be understood as objects, what kinds of things can be understood as continuous fields, what kind of things can be understood as events and processes. There's a huge literature on this area, which was developed a lot by the guys who did it at CJA. There's good papers by Michael Chad, by Andrew, by War Boys, and I was extremely lucky 
to be part of that team, not be a leader. I was never a leader of this area. I was always a follower. But I talked to the guys who actually were doing the thinking. And this kind of learning, because the main objective of the ontology program, which was somehow to be the geospatial semantic web, never worked. A lot of it was sort of abandoned or left behind as something which was not most relevant for geographic information science. And it's even not taught at graduate level. People don't learn about it. And, and they, back to my point about the, the whole Prodis uh, experiment, the whole issue is the time as an essential component is, is something we uh, do not, and, and it's only to our detriment, that we do not teach people, especially remote, remote sensing people in that sense are hopeless. Uh, sorry to be quite blunt. No, but because if you have never been exposed to the basics, and the basics of remote sensing have nothing to do with machine learning algorithms. The basics of remote sensing is what are we seeing? What are the things in the earth? What kind of things do they transform over time? How do they change? Are they stable? What are the concepts we learn? What is a forest? When is a forest a forest? And this is, for me, basic, as basic as mathematics. You know, square root is not going to go away anytime soon, neither are differential equations. And the basics of geographic information science are not going away. They're the basics. So a lot of the people that do, because of, back to your point, the tools that are available that are very useful and very good from the technical point of view, very improved, uh, they do not ask any questions from you. you want to do a map, bring a shapefile, whatever, do things. You're not confronted at every step with questions on the nature of data. And, and uh, this is... Uh, and now if we look back and think about it, essentially, I would going to argue that close to 95% of people who do GIS either use Arc GIS or QGIS or both. Do you disagree with that? No, no, no. So, now, neither... <laughs> Neither, and, and it is not to be expected because they were never designed to be. But nothing in ArcGIS, nor in QGIS, prepares you to deal with time. There's nothing, there's no, uh, there's nothing there. You, they are mapping tools. Absolutely fantastic with good visualization, storytelling, algorithms for doing this, this, and that. And then you say, okay, how do I deal with time in ArcGIS? You don't. How do you deal with time in QGIS? You don't. You abstract it away, put it in a maximum. What you can do is try to put it, the timestamp in a column of, uh, of a spreadsheet or a database and try to, you know, use PostGIS and some queries based on, on that. And that's... And, and, and fine, okay, but if you are someone who know what you're missing, at least you know what you're missing. If you are someone who thinks the tool is the end of life, is all there is to it. All there is to it in my life is I have to learn a little bit of Python and QGs and do something there or learn some Python with ArcGIS or whatever avenue in the old times, and JavaScript or whatever, and then I can produce, fine. 
And many times you get a job, get paid, you know, buy milk for your children, fine. But nothing in what you do prepares you for the basics of the debate. Fair enough. It's just that you, you, it's much more difficult to look to the future, to look forward when you don't know the basics. So back to the tools. So I, I'm, I'm, I use the tools a lot, especially QGIS, but I'm very critical of them because not of them, of what exists, I'm more concerned about what does not exist because there are not enough people thinking about it. I want to come back to some of the open data aspect. From what I understood, we talked about Landsat. It starts in 1972. It's the first public program that allows having Earth observation imagery. But those images are not free. They're not open in the sense that we understand it today. You can't buy a Landsat image. You, you just download it. But right. That wasn't always the case. Exactly. Uh, I talked to Barbara Ryan, which in 2008 uh, was pivotal in making the USGS distributed. But from what I understood in 2006, NP was already doing that. So two years prior, NP is already opening up some of the Landsat imagery. And I'd like to understand that a little bit more because I was quite surprised, to be honest, that the Brazilian agency was the one that opened the data before the American one that had built and operated the satellite. Well, I, I hope that after this conversation, you should not be quite surprised. Okay, I was a director. Well, enlighten me. <laughs> no, no, I mean, come on. Uh, I understand. Things happen in the context. They don't happen out of the blue. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I became director for Earth Observation in Brazil, in uh, INPI in 2001. Then in 2006, I became the director of INPI. Now, we had, for the, all the reasons I explained to you, a clear vision about data openness. Again, it was not, like I think, something that was merely good in the sense of being good per se. Uh, for example, if you follow the writings of uh, Play people like Richard Stallman, who created GNU and the Free Software Foundation, he has, uh, let's say, a normative vision that openness is good per se because openness is good. So that's uh, uh, a certain vision. Our understanding of openness was clearly linked to how important openness was in terms of making the society use and understand the benefits of uh, geospatial information. The logic was, if geospatial information is understood, what needs to be understood by our societies as a means of policy, but also as a means of sheer knowledge of ourselves, knowing ourselves, knowing where we live, knowing who's a neighbor, knowing that, uh, knowing what how to plan, where it was the planning issues. So in the sense that decisions need to be accessible to all. So in that sense, I'm always a sort of a follower and a preacher of the principles of the Rio Declaration. Many people have heard about Rio 92, not so many people have heard about the principles of the Rio Declaration. And again, I want to get Rio 92 Declaration. I think it's principle 12 or principle 11. So if you go back to the Rio Declaration, which again is Environmental issues are best handled with the participation of all concerned citizens at the relevant level. At the national level, each individual shall have appropriate access to information concerning the environment that is held by public authorities. 
including information on hazardous materials and activity to their community, and the participation to participate in the decision-making process. States shall facilitate and encourage public awareness and participation by making information widely available. This is principle 10 of the Rio 92 chart. And this is clear. All countries signed it. I don't know if North Korea signed, but I'm sure that China signed. And the United States, and France, and Brazil. And it's a key principle. People should have information about the environment. If we want to build a sustainable planet. I think there's a difference between wanting and then making it happen. Right. So I, I'm quite curious as to how do you go from that will to making that happen. When I talked to Barbara, one of the elements she mentioned was that these things have costs and rightfully so. And so I'm curious as to how um, you can take some of these uh, declarations and, and actually make it happen and justify that the cost will not be from people paying, but instead it's gonna be taxpayer money. So th there's still a cost, but it's, it's paid in a different manner. I'm right. It, 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 there's, again, there is these issues of, of short-term and long-term accountability in the public sector. And uh, first of all, it's easier to argue when you have international agreed principle, when you're not making the rules by yourself. You know, the whole debate that there's on going on about what constitutes a rules-based order. For me, uh, international law, which means the agreements by United Nations and international charters, are the best we have that encompasses more or less what we could call benefits for whole humanity. We don't have a proper substitute for that. So that's point one, like the International Declaration of the Rights of Man, 1948. So at that moment, when you have a principle, the question now becomes, as you rightly ask, what are the opportunities that you have to make this principle valid? And in some cases, it has to do with uh, to whom are you accountable? Because you, you already had the justification for your action. It's not out of your will, but out of a principle recognized by the United Nations. You don't need to justify because you have the justification from that Kantian sense of the public duty. Now, what you have to do is simply cost. It's much easier there because from much more difficult to justify any public decision is whether you have principles or the law of the legal basis on your side. In this case, I was the director. So I could allocate money. You know, I could find out how much was that coming to INPI, and I could go to other places and get money out of somewhere else and fetch things around and decide on my own, because it was purely a cost issue. In this case, I didn't ask anyone about the cost. It simply said it's going to be done. Cost is, I had a responsibility to manage a budget. As long as the budget fits, it's within my legal responsibility. And if when someone asks me, I said, okay, there's a principle that Brazil has signed into. I'm following the principle. Do you have any other question? You know, so this is like, when it's only about cost, it's also about opportunities. At a certain moment in, in history, in life, you had, I had the opportunity, I had a nice budget, I had shoveled things around. In that case, we had a large project, which is, was very important for me, which was building satellites with China, whose budget dwarfed, like it was like 100 times more than the budget I, not 150 times more than what I got each year for Landsat. So they only had 49 and I won 150% was allocated to make up to do for the Landsat. And that's a decision I did internally, and so on, right? Because 
as long as the satellite gets done, it's not so difficult to get one fiftieth of the budget and put it somewhere else, and no one's going to notice anyway. No, you do. Oh. I'm I'm starting to see a pattern here of having a strong um, will to make things happen, and then just going for them, and more asking for forgiveness than, of than course, permission but to no, actually get things done. I mean, do you know any other thing to get things done in life? I mean, uh, this is more of a I, yeah. <laughs> enlighten me. No, I mean, let's put it this way. No, uh, but I, I think there's this there's this concept. I think of uh, I'm I'm not uh, first of all. I think I mostly agree with you, but I think we have this idea that in an ideal world, everything is a democratic process and uh, uh, voted on and agreed upon. And it's interesting to notice, like the reality of how these things happen is not like that and yeah well yes and no, no. yes and no let me explain the question here is as follows it goes back to the point of what is the role of the bureaucracy of a state okay so it goes back to the very basic question which the people like Max Weber was discussing. What is the role of, say, the bureaucratic bureaucrats, state bureaucrats in the society? Well, they have two things. One thing is, of course, to live within the boundaries of the government, which is the elected government that has put you into place, elected a president, president elects ministers, ministers select whatever directors. That's four years or less or more, but let's take it the election cycle. Then you have other responsibilities that the bureaucrats have. It's towards the state. And the state is that entity that lives beyond the lives of a government. The state is what you aim as a stable. The state is guided by principles. And the principles here, and then there is this debate. What is the level? Why should, why should, if you are a bureaucrat, qualified bureaucrat, which I'm assuming I am, if your government has elect, been elected democratically, which it had, if there are principles guiding your actions, especially principles that feed into, let's say, long-term needs of a state, not of a government. How should you act? And my point here is you should act always as a good bureaucrat in defense of, if you have principles which guide your state, these are the ones that get better. Why did Abraham Lincoln delay on purpose signing the declaration of the end of the Civil War in the United States until after the Slavery Act, slavery was abolished in the U.S. part of it. It's on the Lincoln, it's the biography. Lincoln, he received the rendition. I mean, the Confederates were saying, well, we want to end the war. Lincoln said, wait, 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 wait. I put a lot of hammer down about some months because he first needed to get the act that banished slavery because if he had acted the other way, which is, waited to end the war, led the Confederates back to the U.S. Congress, he would never have passed the Slavery Act. Okay, so what did Lincoln do? He said, no, I'm not going to discuss with these guys. I have principles, higher principles in my life, so I'm going to use my might as president to not to sign the end of the war until I pass my law. And I could give hundreds of these examples in life. I see. Because I appreciate that. The point here is 
back to the what makes I mean, there is a a, a, a a very very interesting uh, guy. He would get, he got tarnished by his declaration. His name is Francis Fukuyama. He's a right winger, but he he has a, a book about the origins of political order. And then he asks himself and the reader the following question: How Denmark came to be Denmark? He said, well, Denmark, in our minds, is that beautiful place where everything works. You know, you know, everything works, the government is nice, the queen, you know, when she feels it's time, she goes and says, okay, and then she leaves. Did you see the queen leave in the room? The queen goes there, she sits, now the new government, hands, shake hands, open the door, and that's it. It's gone. Denmark. How did Denmark get to be Denmark? Well, we got to be Denmark because you have a state bureaucracy that defends the country against itself. You, if you have not seen, I, it's a lesson in politics. There's a nice Netflix series called Borgen. And this is about this lady who becomes first mini uh, prime minister of Denmark, and she has to fight the civil service. The civil service is trying to tell her what she should do. Because the civil service knows best than the government. There's another one, which is absolutely fantastic. The best, one of the best comedies I ever ever seen, on the BBC. Old comedy called Yes, Prime Minister. And it's the same story. Guy comes, up, yes, minister. The guy becomes a minister in the UK government, and he has to face the chief bureaucrat of the government. And of course, the chief bureaucrat knows the minister. He thinks the minister is a stupid guy. And he is the one who should be running the country. Therefore, my point is, Denmark, UK, France, Germany, got to be democratic countries because their civil bureaucracies have maintained a, 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 a modicum and a good amount of power to avoid bad things being done. And if you look outside Europe, you're going to see Places where there is a very stable bureaucracy, too much bureaucracy, state, which is China is the prime example, extremely good, extremely capable, a point to the point, of course, of, 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 of uh, sort of uh, making democracy non, almost non-existence. And the other extreme, where democracy exists, but the bureaucracy is so badly and so out without power, that it has been overwhelmed. This country is not a developing country. It's called the United States of America, which is, if it continues that way, with a very weak bureaucracy, very fragile, very prone to authoritarian people, how, how can the United States have the resilience to survive 21st century after China. So my point here is there is, I have a real sense of being in a pride of being someone. I like to say I'm not dot gov, I'm B I'm dot BR. I'm someone who looks after the interests of the Brazilian state. And I have my results to prove it. The nice thing is, after you, you get away with so many pushing so many doors that you get away by saying this has to be done because it's the right thing. On that note, one of the topics I've been quite curious to ask you about is the development of a lot of uh, private commercial earth observation companies. So it's a, a departure from governmental and public programs like MODIS, like Landsat that we talked about, where these pro projects have been developed by programs, by public programs like NASA, operated by public programs like NP and USGS. We move away from that model to a model where there's private fundings that creates these companies like the planets of the world um, or uh, even older companies like Airbus um, who operate uh, 
things like Terrasar X uh, or Playatis, like all these private uh, endeavors. And um, at least from what I've seen you talk about, I've gotten the impression that you were quite critical of those uh, programs, of having a lot of the data available, but um, behind uh, basically a paywall, like you need to pay for those for those data. Um, so first of all, is that assessment correct? And if so, I'd like to understand more about why. Okay, the assessment is correct. Let me start with the why. Well, my point is simple, that uh, model does not fit the interest of developing countries, which make up 80% of the world, 90% of the world, let's put it 80% of the world's population and growing. It's point one. But let's go back a little bit before planning. What actually is happening here? What happens here is during the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the U.S. government, and of course other governments, but to a lesser extent, were spending a huge amount of money uh, developing uh, satellite, spy satellite technologies. And the, the model was basically, these were contracted out, much any like weapon. It was deal, dealt with as weapons, as, which they are from the point of view of U.S. military. So you buy, like you buy a Lockheed F-16, you, you have a tender and you say, okay, I want to buy the satellite and the company builds and you operate. And that was like the whole Earth observation satellites, which were basically out of companies who were sworn to secrecy uh, to the Brazilian government, as many of them still are, McDonald, uh, the Twilight, uh, Lockheed and Boeing and so on. Now, after the Reagan administration and after some of these uh, Clinton administration, you had uh, an idea that it would be more interesting because the fall of the, the wall and the end of the Soviet Union was supposed to bring a peace dividend. In other words, you were supposed to spend less on arms and more on other beautiful, more on the cure of malaria, for example. That didn't happen, but let's leave it aside. The point here was all countries were faced with the say, how can I justify uh, so much money being put into arms and weapons and so on? And in the case of, of remote sensing, especially high-resolution remote sensing. The U.S. government had this idea of saying, okay, I'm going to first publish a policy about commercial uh, commercial access to Earth observation, and then act on terms of this policy. So if you read the Commercial Act, I think by Bill Clinton, I have to remember the exact date, but the Commercial Act says the following. Effectively, space is not free. You can only launch a high observation satellite from the United States if you obey our laws. And what do our laws, our Pentagon, say? Well, you're entitled to have your own high resolution satellites. We're entitled to buy it, some of the images, which would cover your cost. And if we buy, you cannot sell it to anyone else. And if we tell you that you cannot sell, a high-resolution image to someone, you cannot sell it. So this is the licensing terms, which essentially are valid to this day. So at that term, what the government said was try to reduce the risks of internal development, which have been criticized. There is much criticism about the over-cost overruns that have befelt every single weapons program in the United States. You just look at that and you see how they ended up costing two, three, four, ten times the original budget. So they said, no, we're going to do the following. We're going to sign a check to Company X of so many million dollars to buy so many images. And we, if you 
give us so many images, the check is yours. The money is on the table. So we're going to push these guys to do it. Well, this led to space imaging, you may remember, then digital globe, and this was the first wave of commercial air observation satellites, it was nothing to do with planet, was digital globe, space image, and so on, which were maintained essentially by Pentagon. By This was the bread and butter. They would never have survived as long as they did uh, by, uh, by simply selling images to, and they were not even allowed. Some people who wanted to buy would never have been given the images in the first place. So that's the late 90s, early 2000s, In right? late 90s, uh, early 2000s. If you, if you just take right. uh, Digital Globe was founded in 92, okay? And space imaging is probably around a little bit of that date. So that was, uh, then they had the uh, GOI. So basically, GOI was, GOI was orbital image corp. So there was a lot of these offset, but there was essentially Companies, oh, nine, okay, Land Remote Sensing Policy Act 92. That was my other point. So that's, we're looking at the Clinton the here. Okay, did we, 92 or Reagan? Land Remote Sensing Policy Act. Let me just get. I think it was more to get like a, a an idea of okay. what. Okay, but rough I, 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 period I, I'm a, <laughs> Max, you know, the problem here, once you get deep into something, you never are able to give an honest and short answer. You sure as short <laughs> as it's... No. No, let, let me put it this way. You, you can be either short or honest. Okay? Because <laughs> to understand planet, if you don't understand what happened before, you cannot give an honest answer and a clear answer. And a, okay, so we're back to digital globe. We're back to these times. And there was a consolidation. Now you have Maxar. Then what happened? Then you have the modernization of, let's say, not the modernization, you have entrepreneurs who decided they could do different. Basically, they were sort of inspired by Elon Musk and his Falcons. And they say, but this is an old system. I'm going to do something better, something much fantastic. And uh, let's say Planet is one of the offshots. Umber Space is another one. Then they find out what Maxar, Digital Globe and Space Imaging, found. Who is buying those images? Because the question here is, who has the power to buy massive amounts of planet data so that the company becomes solvent? Remember that planet was, at the last I looked, $150 million in the red. They're still in the red after all these years. And they've been benefited by lots of goodwill from the people like the Norwegian government that have bought planet data. Other than that, the question becomes, whether they're going to make enough, there's enough money to be made from planet data to justify its existence in capitalism as a commercial entity. The jury is still out, and my answer is no. But I'm going to say no, and maybe five years' time you're going to prove. But why? Planet has a problem. It's not high resolution enough to be key for the military, which have infinite pockets. If it would be high resolution enough to the military, of course, the Pentagon would buy. And it's not cheap enough or streamlined enough to be a clear substitute for Sentinel-2 and Landsat in the task that Sentinel-2 and Landsat do. To have this kind of neither, so it's like a vegan, but I'm not, I'm not fish, I'm not meat, I'm not chicken, I'm a vegan. And, 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 and then you, because out of the hype, okay, fair enough, nice. And then you say, okay, how can I, me, INPI, Brazil, build an operational system 
that replaces what we have now. Uh, if I have the choice between Sentinel and, and, and Planet, and money is no problem, which one would we choose? We would go for Sentinels. We would go for Sentinels any day. Even if Planet would be, even if Planet data would be zero cost, we would still go for Sentinels and the current Planet data. Why is that? Because when you get, you need to say, again, all things must serve a purpose. So deforestation in Brazil needs to serve a purpose, which is to support public policy. Like I explained before, it needs to avoid false positives, it needs to provide timely information, and it needs to information which means good and fast, and it needs to be reliable in the sense that the information I give you this year is consistent with the date the information I give you next year. And it must be just enough for public policy. So when you look at planet data, you see a very different ecosystem than the one you look at Sentinel data. In Sentinels, you still are able to characterize more or less clearly what is deforestation, what is clear cuts, what are places which being clear as we see, what are places that are being burned. We have found that this information is at the current state of policy enough for policy making. Um, it's not clear that the definitions of forest that can be extracted out of planet data are reliable and clear to extract as they are in Sentinel data. In a certain sense, a lower resolution of 10 meters is better for interpreters, both computer and visual, than the lower resolution of planet. Because, and, and notwithstanding the fact that planet data has a variable quality, they're not analysis writing. But leaving that aside, the other problem is, what do I do when I look at planet data? How do I approach this data to obtain a reliable information? Do I just do 2D uh, cubic convolutions, uh, computational neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and I get the results? Show me. There are results coming out. And they show, they show basically, uh, I've seen the results using Planet, and they, they show results that doesn't make any sense. Oh, I. I can see that deforestation in the Amazon, in the area where I have planet, is much bigger than the one reported by Prodis using Landsat. And I said, of course it is. Of course it is. So what? I have a 30-year, 40-year time series to maintain, my dear. I cannot just switch from, I can switch from Landsat to Sentinels if I keep my math, my algorithms right. But I cannot switch to Landsat and, and, and Prodis and pretend I still have a time series. So, so the problem here is, even if you give me, and that's exactly the case, Norway has given us free planet images. I'm not using it. Because I know what I want. You see, so the problem here, if the one of the players who is in a position to justify the use of planet because for if we would if Brazil INPI Brazil would be able to put planet into the deforestation mapping system, the Norwegians will be able to tell themselves they have you have justified the money I invested in buying planet data, and we say we're not investing on it; it's not worth it. I cannot get information which is reliable out of it. Reliable in the sense that I'm talking about, that is consistent over time, consistent with the full time series, that guarantees that I have um, a small number of false positives, that matches the definition of forest that has been in use since the 80s. 
So it's not just the fact that if you have a higher resolution data, it is better. It is better for which purpose, I may ask? So for the purpose of the work of deforestation mapping at NP, that's not the right tool. That's not about, at the moment. You see, I'm, I'm not yeah, yeah, discounting yeah. the fact. No, that, no, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, so because uh, the right tool, anything you say about the tool might change. So, so back to my point is, okay, now look at the following. If you go south of the equator, okay, if you go south of the equator, if you go north of the equator, these countries are rich enough to do whatever they want. If you go south of the equator, and including China south of the equator as well, so just to, you would need to make planet viable commercially. You would need planet to make a splash. In other words, planet to be so much more useful than sentinels to justify a massive shift from Landsats and Sentinels to planet. Which, of course, would put pressure on whatever governments, donors, no matter what, people to pay for the planet data. Now, if the country south of the equator, who has, by any measure you take, leadership in tropical remote sensing, remote sensing of, you know, among developing countries, certainly on tropical regions, tells you that it's not doing it, who is going to buy it? Okay, Congo is going to buy it. No, Congo is not going to buy it. Norway is buying for Congo. Vietnam is going No, no one is buying Planet Data. It's Norway which is sort of financing in the hope that Planet Data turns out to be useful. Fair enough. Nice from, nice from the Norwegians. But if I had to buy, I would not it. I would not buy it. So now in SAR, what you have, you have Umber and similar SAR data, which is essentially X and, and ISI, ISAT, it's ISI. They're basically X-band satellites. Now you have a different problem. It, how good is X-band for ice and ships in the Northeast and the Arctic? Very good. How good is X-band for tropical regions? Can the signals from the X-band penetrate the canopy of the forest? Or are they just, it, 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 the response, of, how different is the response of the canopy of a, a natural forest different from the response that you get when trees are on the ground? Very small. That's a property of the X-band satellites. A property of X-band. And what we found over the years is that the L C-band like in Sentinel complementary to Sentinel-2, yes. Reliable, you have to go to L-band. And L-band, there's nothing. There's the Japanese who don't give us their data. But there's no operational global monitoring system in L-band satellite. And that's the problem. Again, back to the issue of to become an operational commercial service, you need an operational Commercial custom. The guy here, yes, I'm operational commercial customer of, you know, the guy who sells me access to my iPhone. If I were to, to play devil's advocate, and for the record, one of the things I find most interesting about working in this field is that I don't know the answer to this gamble as well. I've mentioned it full, multiple times. I feel like a lot of the commercial earth observation field is a big house of cards, and we're kind of in the middle of seeing if it's going to pan out. But leaving that aside, if I were to play devil's advocate, I feel like what I'm hearing from some of these commercial companies is that there's a bet that if you make some of that, if you make enough of that high resolution in terms of spatial and temporal data available, you open up a whole industry um, that can use these images that isn't served by either the spatial or the temporal aspect of Sentinel. So that by having a high resolution and maybe a high revisit, there is a commercial um, or there would be a commercial uh, 
downstream analytics companies that would buy enough of these images that it makes sense. Uh, I feel like that's the motivation behind a lot okay. of those companies. So let's look at the basics now, Rex. Let's look at the basics. What are the basics? The basics is the following. If you get the, the big users of high-resolution data, namely the American military, a lot of their interpretation is still visual interpretation. Because, of course, they are, in many cases, they're the battlefield, and they have to have reconnaissance information and, and couple that and so on and so forth. Okay, and uh, of course the military have deep pockets and, and that is out of the question to be used for every application of planet data. Now, if you don't have the luxury of having visual interpretation for planet data, what are the alternatives? And then the sta you start getting into a confusion. Now you go back to the basics of data analytics in imagery. So essentially, to this day, you have three or four alternatives in general. First one is classify one image pixel-wise, okay, and then get the results. And then what you do with the results, of course, if you now back to a resolution where you no longer have the canopy of trees, but have trees and things in the middle, you're likely to get a lot of outliers, which you're going to have to deal with. And then uh, by the time you sort of sort the outliers, you're back to the 10 meter resolution where the sentinels are good. Point one. Now you say, okay, point two, I am going to uh, not to do it. I'm going to use convolutional neural networks or transformers using basically, but essentially it's the same. I take two dimensional chips which represents a certain amount of patterns. And I assume that these patterns, uh, the, the nice thing about convolutional neural networks is they're linearly invariant to translation. So the let's say the bespoke application, which people love, is getting airplanes in the ground because the airplane must be one way, one way, still the convolutional neural networks is able to get the airplane because the airplanes have a, a fixed and expected shape. And the shape of the airplane will not change if it's upside down or downside up or whatever. So convolution neural networks have established themselves as a way to identify objects whose shape is well known and trainable by the CNN. Now, are the shapes that we deal in environment data linearly invariant? Okay. Uh, 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 to what extent can I produce a set of, of training data of 2D chips that are linearly invariant and consistent in terms of the response so that I can pick up any shape or form here and I'm able to distinguish it only using 2D chips. The current answer is not yet. So currently, you don't have any killer application, and there, believe me, people have tried to do it. Okay, there are lots of papers, mostly not reproducible, but anyway, there's nothing that you can say, but that's the killer. And then, okay, and then you go to option three, which is time series. So instead of classifying what I call uh, space, you go time first, space later, so you classify pixels in time, and then you sort of use uh, some kind of smoothing to clean up the outliers. Again, the problem here for planet is that unlike the sentinels, the data is not stable enough in terms of time to guarantee that if I get values from uh, one month, these values are correspondent to the values of the same uh, ground target in mountain. Well, that might change as the planet data gets better and better. Again, it's not. So I'm, what I'm telling you is, is that people are saying it will happen. And they've been saying this. And I'm saying, okay, do they understand? Do these, these people that say a fantastic application will come along that's going to use the power of planets to revolutionize 
the remote sensing stack. And I'm trying to tell you, I have my, and I always go to the basics. Yeah, there's a, some basic stuff here related to Earth observation, machine learning, and algorithms, which needs to be carefully streamlined, which is in the case of Sentinels, the ARD data from Sentinel, uh, to make sure the plenity is okay. So, in that sense, you will not find killer applications today using Planet. More, more than it, you don't have enough developers motivated and with Planet data to build these applications. Who are these guys? I mean, who, again, the question becomes, in terms of remote sensing, where does innovation come from? So, you will argue that innovation in terms of sensors, hardware, has come from industry most of the time, under contracts or not contracts by the government. Planets, Sentinels, box size, you know. Now, if you go to the software, algorithms, at least up to now, all the algorithms we know and love from remote sensing, they have originally come from somewhere else, typically from the research community, and then from research, they've moved into operations by means of having them available commercial tools like ArcGIS or non-commercial tools like Quantum GIS and the Python plugins. But they existed somewhere. I have, a, I have, for example, ArcGIS, one of the applications that ArcGIS runs for regionalization is a paper I'm co-authored. They never paid anything because, of course, they looked at the paper. What, what ArcGIS did was look at different papers and implemented the one they saw was best. Fair enough. That's the game. But ArcGIS did not invent that method or for, for God, with reason, none of the methods available in ArcGIS nor QGIS were invented by the developers of Esri or the guys in QGIS. They all come from somewhere else. So my argument is the industry itself, up to this moment, industry remote sensing, has not been able to produce innovation in the sense of things that not exist before in remote sensing analysis. And I'm happy to be pointed to be proven elsewhere. And first of all, like I appreciate you mentioning those. I think the cards are still being dealt in a lot of these areas. I think there's a lot more investment that's coming in into a lot of these pub private areas. I think a lot of it has happened outside of what we call remote sensing as well. I would point to something like, this is outside of the environmental sciences, which I think a lot of what we've grounded this conversation around is in some of your work, of course, which is like environmental sciences. But I think a lot of the work of imagery interpretation has been done at a large scale by the Googles and the Apples of the world for things like Google Maps or Uber or things like that, which like the whole self-driving aspect of um, technology, which isn't directly, you know, it, it's not the environmental science aspect, but there's a lot of overlap with, with mapping and some of the remote sensing aspects. And I would argue there has been a lot of innovation in that sense, but it doesn't get published in remote sensing papers because I think the use cases are quite different. But that being said, I think I still get your point. No, I think you have a point here, but because this is the innovation is sort of a, a, a term that has many senses. One fair enough. One point of innovation, and that is one that has to be credited to you mentioned Google, Uber, and 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 similar, and and, and ways or something. 
is massive data handling or massive geographic data handling. So the ability to organize massive amounts of spatial data quickly, rapidly, in such that provides multiple pyramids, data organizations, and, and the links and so on, which, of course, has had a lot of investment. Uh, you may have seen uh, the case against, this is this movie about the case against Google Earth, uh, the, the German guys, which developed this. Uh, but essentially, these methods, again, I'm going to argue that the basic of the methods for for indexing spatial data dates from the 80s, R trees and so on. But of course, one thing is having an algorithm that does an R tree. The other thing is working it in a billion polygons. And that kind of expertise in massive data handling is undoubtedly the work of very capable engineers working in Google ways. And that's that that of course. And that has taken a massive amount of intellectual work. Okay, point taken. In the sense that I refer to innovation, what I refer to were what we might now talk about data analytics. So the data analytics is not the way you organize your data for faster access, uh, quicker visualization. But the fact that you use some numerical techniques to, out of the information available, extract something that you didn't have. And in this case, you could still make a case that uh, the private industry has played an important role. Take, for example, the whole effort that Facebook, the Meta Facebook, did on Torch, on PyTorch. Uh, yes. So again, the whole logic of tensors, which is mathematics, was developed by people like Yale Kuhn when he was in Montreal and Bangio and so on. And when they went to when Yan went to Beta, they sort of uh, launched PyTorch, which is a major piece of good engineering. But still, it doesn't do things for you. You have to use PyTorch to do things, and and that's. Uh, that's the point I wanted to to try to finish. I do feel like we're we're coming to a natural end. This could last like three more hours. Um, I do like asking, uh, like wrapping these conversations up, also by asking for a book recommendation, and if you listen to any a podcast. And there's a couple reasons uh, I do like asking for those. Just. Mostly because I think it's an interesting way to learn more about people and their interest. And that's how a lot of recommendation works. It's still a lot of word of mouth. So yeah, if, is there, I'd like to, yeah, uh, leave it to one book. If there's one book that you would recommend people read, what would that be? I would have to go for Pogliani. I, I think I would go for Pogliani. It's called the book called The Great Transformation. Uh, Poliani is is a uh, it's an economic historian, and he is uh, basically the great transformation is a vision of how the capitalist society evolved and how it did dominate the world and the the machine the mechanisms that it had uh, developed. Trying to see, yeah, Poliani is still the reference. Um, more in a more personal basis. Pollyanna would be well if it's one book. It's because we're immersed. The the issue here is you and I are immersed in the daily changes in technology, and we are so much immersed that sometimes we don't recognize the the megatrends. And, and, and by looking at history, by looking at how this, uh, how, how the world that we live came up to be, 
the other the other book well I'm not cheating now, but the other book uh which was very important in my uh which I would also it's closer to us, but still for me a classic. It's actually uh, a trilogy by a Spanish professor called Manuel Castells, C-A-S-T-E-L-L-S, and it's called The Age of Information. It's a trilogy where he, the information age, economy, in English is the information age, economy, society, and culture. Uh, it's, uh, there's an entry on Wikipedia, and um, he was one of the first that theorized about the so-called network society. So Pugliani gives you a sense of how capitalism evolved, and uh, Castells was a book for the ages. It's a book for the internet era. So what he discusses is how networks, in, in the network age, and in now the rise of the network society, how we are talking today, why how can we? How could we relate? In normal terms, we wouldn't. But of course, you are someone who is famous in in by your podcast. Now, the other question which I which I see, podcasts yours. I've seen a couple of two. I should see more. And I also like to see, but that's from a personal point of view, uh, the one uh, on. Uh, there's one that talks about uh, uh, satellite image deep learning by Robin Cole. It's more because I'm obviously interested in deep learning and I, I see how he does things, and that's, that's one. Yours is good, very good, and I think you do the great job. Robin is more, much more focused on specifics, and he has some interviews and so on. But I would recommend, if you have not read Castells, take your time to read it. It's enlightening. It's enlightening. It's good. Castell, I think he talked, he's old now, but he used to teach in Berkeley for a long time. He's quite influential. Now, not that you have asked me, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, the other book, which has been very important to me, is called by Larry Lesson. It just things come popping up to my mind. I know that you're going to cut it, but it's just from a personal okay. point. Uh, uh, Lawrence Lessig, which is a, you may have heard him, he is a professor on on internet and he internet law and so on. He has this marvelous book called Code, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. It's a full title. It's magnificent. Now. I don't know how much you want, and now it's between Gilberto and Max, how much you want to get into the debates of where we are going with capitalism. I don't know how much you get in <laughs> No, no, because, I, the, are you? I feel like it's a big Pandora's box that we could open. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's just because I've just finished a book, which you might have read, it's called Techno Feudalism by the Greek uh, economist uh, Yanis Varoufakis. And there's this whole debate whether we're living in, in the, a new era. Uh, uh, this is like an ongoing debate on uh, we live in which, are we living in a new economic era by, uh, by, uh, because of the changes in technology and IEA and so on? So Varoufakis makes a point. I'm not sure I fully agree with him, but that's the debate we're going on. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say on a personal note, I feel like I've been speaking more English than any other language over the past five years. And the main other language I speak is French. Right. And I felt a shift in the way I think by the types of societies that I get exposed to in those different languages. And so I feel like my personal change in 
like feeling over the past decade has been in part due to talking to different people because I'm talking a different language. And so I, hence why I don't know is because I, I haven't thought about it enough, but I've noticed that there's been a change in being exposed more to like an American society by speaking more English. I don't know. I mean, but you could, could, could go back to your French sources and uh, I was almost tempted. I am starting to do that more and more. Yeah. I guess it's growing up a bit. I, I was almost tempted to to say that the, the book, but I haven't read, I haven't finished it. I actually began it. And, but uh, talking about French is the Piketty. Have you heard of Thomas Piketty from the French University? I have not. A Piketty is perhaps the most influential French intellectual of these days because he talks about, about inequality. And he has a book about the capital in the 20th century. And he is, he is in English. There's a French version, of course. But Piketty is, um, it is very influential. And he's been talking a lot about how our societies are shaping for the 21st century. It's a yeah. rereading of the old Marx book. But the base story is to end the whole, the whole debate about books. Is my sense is that given that we spend better part of our lives immersed in things like code and immediate results is absolutely necessary that we go for books which span especially longer time periods which give us a sense of where we come here where we may go and uh, so that would be my general recommendation. Appreciate your time. I appreciate you telling me about how you think. I think this was one of the goals that I wanted to, to walk away from. This is just have a better understanding of some of the work that you've done, the context around it. And for that, I very much appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate your time and your interest. And it's been a pleasure. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour l'attention. Merci de ton temps. C'était formidable. L'opportunité de parler avec vous. Merci, merci, merci de tout mon cœur. Eh ben, j'en suis très heureux et ça fait bizarre de parler un peu en français, mais ça me touche beaucoup. <rire> non, non, ce français, c'est fantastique. Hein? Oh, on commence. Si on va français, on va parler avec le très vert. <rire> non, non, non. Si on a... Oh, don't get me started. Je, je vais te parler avec la... Uh, no, but I like the idea of just ending on a French note for the people okay. who've been listening to merci. Yeah, merci beaucoup. Hey, thank you so much for listening to this conversation. I wanted to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, but also all the people who financially support me on Patreon. If everything goes well, these conversations should feel and sound seamless and effortless, but there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. I try to research and prepare these as much as I can to know who these people are and what makes them interesting and what would lead to a good conversation. I'm incredibly thankful to all the people who support my work on Patreon, meaning I can do a little bit more of it. This podcast started out as a way to learn more about the people in this industry, but I've also started making educational content on another YouTube channel that I'll put a link to in the show notes. And I want to make more content explaining how satellite images and maps work to a broader audience, as well as continuing to research the guests for these podcast episodes. So if you value the work that I do, I'd like to ask you to please consider supporting my work on Patreon. There's also some behind the scenes of how this podcast is done and some of the work that I'm doing for these educational videos if you want to learn more about how I do all of this. Either way, thank you so much for all of your attention and your time. I really appreciate it, and I hope you get value from these conversations. Thanks.